Alrighty, folks, this is episode one of Talking in the Woods, mm -hmm. and we both have room for flapping. We had to move, we had to move locations because there wasn't enough arm flapping <laughs> space, mm -hmm. but now we have adequate room for flapping. This is my friend Jerome. We're going to have a little triangular conversation. We have a live audience back here. Let's hear some new... Yeah. Talking in the Woods. We're doing it big out here. We got the live audience. We got the tripod. Jerome always has amazing questions. I love to philosophize about everything. And he's always like giving me some stuff that actually stretches my brain. A lot of times people just ask me stuff and it's like I already have the answer ready because people have asked me that a million times. But his questions are always like, just stretch, stretching my mind. So yeah. we could have just had this conversation in the woods, him and I, but I was telling him, I believe that I am a cell in the body of earth. And why not talk to just one other cell when I could talk to maybe a hundred other cells, including you. There you go. So, um, yeah, we're just going to kind of have a semi-spontaneous conversation here. He's into a philosopher named Ken Wilbur, mm -hmm. which some of you might have heard about. He has all kinds of cool thoughts, and I'm really into a philosopher named Charles Eisenstein, which many of you have probably heard of also. And so I sent him some essays about Charles Eisenstein. So he's only read a few essays on Charles Eisenstein, but he probably has more knowledge on Ken Wilber stuff. But we're both just like to philosophize, so we figured we'd come out here and have a little conversation. Mm -hmm. So one concept I want to discuss today is called reality tunnels. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll dive into that. Another concept is how all the problems in the world are actually interconnected. They're not like these separate issues. They're all kind of woven together. And maybe we could talk about ego death or ego development because we had some people in the in the audience that were wanting to talk about that. How's that sound? Yeah, that sounds perfect, bro. So let's let's actually just get to it. Let me ask my first question. Yeah. Okay. So um, first of all, who is Charles Eisenstein? Yeah. And actually, what made you get interested into him to begin with? Yeah, it's a good question. So back in high school, my junior year of high school, I did not like reading at all. I cheated on every test and read only the spark notes pretty much but i got a laptop and i started going on youtube and i found this community that was into this book called ishmael mm -hmm. and so i was like i think i need to read this book called ishmael even though i don't read books and i'm not into books yeah. i'm gonna read this book called ishmael and it just like totally changed my life it showed me how everything in the world got to be the way it is today and I was just like, holy shit, this book is amazing. So I wanted to like keep going down the rabbit hole. I read three more books by Daniel Quinn, who's the author of Ishmael. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I heard about this dude called Derek Jensen, who's like even the next level after Daniel Quinn. Derek Jensen's whole belief is that civilization is like a virus on the planet and that we're literally gonna kill this planet if we don't destroy civilization or kind of like completely shift it and I was really into his stuff. I read like seven of his books in a row. I was like hardcore, basically believing that civilization is a complete virus to the planet and that we need to like actively destroy civilization. <laughs> and there's a lot of very valid points that he makes. I mean, literally in like a hundred years of industrial civilization, we've destroyed like 90% of the oceans, 70% of the forests, endangered species are going so it's like mm -hmm. from a from a high above time scale you're like once civilization industrial civilization showed up we fucked ourselves over like in a blink of an eye that's fair yeah so anyways from there i heard about this dude charles eisenstein has this incredible book called the ascent of humanity like the upward journey of humanity so i was like all right i'm gonna i'm gonna check this out and his whole theory is that <clears throat> civilization is not like this wrong turn because there's people like Derek Jensen that say civilization is the virus on the planet. But then other people are like, well, we actually screwed up even before civilization when we created fire because fire separated us from the crazy wild nature. And it was like a, we screwed ourselves up from then. So they're like, maybe we, maybe we screwed up. Maybe we made the wrong turn before fire when we created language because that separated us that created like a subject object thing before that it was just like this blur of energy 
So it's like, where did we make the wrong turn is, is Charles Eisenstein's big question. He's like, maybe we never made a wrong turn. Maybe we're actually just on this big journey of fucking evolution and learning. And this Terrence McKenna says, who you also got to check out Terrence McKenna. He's like, we're just this big experiment with nature was like, hey, let's create monkeys that have big ass brains that can fucking build cities and shit. <laughs> like, let's see what happens. You know, um, so anyway, Charles Eisenstein's book really changed my life because it made me realize maybe, maybe civilization isn't actually wrong completely, but we Woo! do, we do need yeah. to, we do need to reintegrate it into nature and like find a harmonious balance with nature. And an interesting thing to compare is like the concept of as above, so below, like we're in this macrocosmic microcosmic thing mm -hmm. if you look at a cell a cell actually has kind of like a city type structure it's like got all these different sectors and things that are happening so the theory is like look nature is agreeing um the theory is that maybe um john Collar, can you make sure we're actually still filming <laughs> <laughs> if not it's not the what end of the world question again? um we're good all right Happy Tuesday, y'all. Um, so, so the theory is that maybe, maybe our our society is not this devilish curse, but it's actually like the next level of evolution. But we need to find balance with nature because we're clearly kind of out of balance. So Charles Einstein has a lot of great insights to share on that, and he explains that all the problems of the world are interconnected because they're all part of like a story. He's all about like analyzing the stories that our society is telling, mm -hmm. such as the story that we are separate from nature. We have this whole thing that we're meant to like dominate nature and we're separate from it. Humans are like this other special creature and that basic philosophy comes with it more things like um you know we we can just dominate everything and like trees who cares about trees who cares about other animals they're all just for us to like exploit whereas other different worldviews, such as many indigenous cultures see everything as like part of the web of life and important so anywho that's a bunch of information i'm happy to hear what you got to say okay many okay uh, that was pretty dense uh, there's a lot of questions i have in there um so my first question i would ask you well second question i would ask you is where in, in with charles eisenstein where does he point at where the separation between that like we are oneness mm -hmm. with nature and nature is sacred where does he say that 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 notion broke down mm -hmm. like where where did the was it a uh, what uh what worldview changed that, yeah, yeah, yeah. that separated us from nature sure. yeah it's a good question can you can you stand just a little bit this way um so a huge shift was definitely with agriculture because previous to that we were hunters and gatherers but as soon as we started planting things then we had to have an area that was like we had to defend a certain area and say no one's no wolves are allowed to eat my food no rabbits so we started like creating this alternative realm. From other people either. Yeah, and from other tribes too, exactly. Um, so, so that created like a new realm, a, a new domain. The first shift was the fire because the fire separated like this is the human realm and this is like the wild wilderness realm. And then agriculture was like another level up from there. Mm -hmm. And then when we created like religion also or like modern monotheistic religion, it put like divinity idealism up in the sky. And it said earth is like less sacred than up there. So that created another level of kind of separation. And then it continued with like industrial revolution, having machines that could do all kinds of stuff we've been on this journey of separation but you could see it also as like a spiral of coming back into like unity consciousness of seeing everything as interconnected um okay. so let me ask my second let me ask my third question yeah okay so 
basically you can say if i'm getting what you're saying correctly yeah um you can say the past ten thousand years of human civilization we have separated ourselves from nature basically yeah now my question is if we look at let's just say like and i'm gonna I'm challenge you on this yeah yeah, yeah let's just say like i do want to feel connected much more with nature mm -hmm. And I do think that the things that are happening in the world are horrible, such mm -hmm. as like what's happening in like um, with cobalt mining and yeah. things of that nature. Yeah. Um, and the chopping down of the rainforest, et cetera. Yeah. How does, I'm gonna challenge you on this. Yeah. How does one actually live in like a modern civilization uh -huh. in the 21st century yeah. and also try to be connected with nature meanwhile like their house is literally a representation of like that's not being the case because you uh -huh. you literally had to cut down all the trees in order to live in your house you yeah. literally had to yeah. extract a whole bunch of stuff from the earth just to put a battery in your exactly. iphone so yeah. let me hear what yeah, you, yeah yeah what you think about this well there's a whole realm of philosophy called appropriate technology which is just about using what we need but not living in extreme excess and extravagance that's unnecessary and ultimately unsustainable like back in let's say 400 years ago the the units of energy that a human had available to it every day was like a horse and buggy and like you know firewood and stuff like that nowadays we have like 10 million units of energy at our blink of an eye because we've got coal plants we've got cars on fuel but that those things are unsustainable all, all unless we figure out how to really tap into a sustainable free energy source which is hypothetically possible but to answer your question i really think the two keys are learning from indigenous cultures there's literally say four thousand unique indigenous cultures still living pretty much in harmony with nature to this hey, day hey. <laughs> hey yeah 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 if you check out Survival International, that is a whole group that works to protect these different cultures that are still, such as the Hadza people out in Africa. There's, you know, the Shipibo tribe in Peru. There's many different cultures that are still living in pretty good harmony with the web of life. They're not using more than they need for the most part. And so it it is possible. And then permaculture is a whole system that was kind of adapted from indigenous teachings as well as just ecology observing nature and being like how does a forest work what are the principles that keep a forest going without anybody fucking maintaining it mm -hmm. you know and um and so they developed these principles which now many people including the land that we're currently on our friend here is using permaculture principles to grow a food forest which is a very efficient way to grow food and so there are ways to live more in harmony with nature where we're not like totally separate from it mm -hmm. and permaculture is one example there's all kinds of natural buildings such as Cobb I was blessed to go to the Cobb village in Port in Oregon which is basically like a hobbit village they have like 10 to 20 of these homes that are built out of um clay sand and straw it's like a combination mm -hmm. forms like this you know clay sort of home mm -hmm. and it's amazing when you go inside you feel like you're in the earth you don't feel like you're in a freaking building or anything so it's definitely possible and i actually have a playlist on my youtube channel of like 50 videos of places that are demonstrating how to live more in harmony with nature interesting so yeah Interesting. Okay, so um, let me uh, let me uh, let me hit on something um, something important that I think that you said because you because yeah. you talked about like the history of a civilization with the first starting sixty thousand years ago with the fire and then going yeah, yeah, to yeah. like domestication of crops and then you get like Mesopotamia and all that stuff. Yeah. That's super interesting. What for those that don't know, like I'm super interested in spiral dynamics. Yeah. I think spiral dynamics is unbelievably interesting, right? The idea of that human civilizations went from archaic to a magic worldview, to a mythic worldview, to a rational worldview, to a pluralistic worldview. Yeah. That's unbelievably interesting to me. Yeah. Um, I wanna ask um, another thing. Um, Can you just step one step this way? I think you'll be in the frame. No problem. Yeah. Um, one thing I might challenge you a little bit on is, um, the idea 
it seems to me a little reductionistic mm -hmm. um, saying that all the world problems is because of one single variable. Hmm. Yeah. I, 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 I'm skeptical of reductionism. Sure. Could you, um, what, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. what do you, what do you think about that? So, yeah, I wouldn't say that they're all boiled down to one single variable, but they, they all generally go on a certain story that humanity is telling itself which i think is like this story of progress like you go to a, think about the words we use a lot of these things uh, this is what the book ishmael showed me it's like they're invisible to us we're so used to it that we don't even realize think about how people say third world countries mm -hmm. oh we're over here in the first, first world, world they're the third world what are they still doing they're developing that means they're trying to get to where we are Oh, you want to be like Americans with the biggest mental health issue in the history of the universe? The fucking, you know, suicide rates are through the roof. We've got like a zillion problems. Like we haven't figured it out. We figured out some things, but we certainly have holes in our in our process, you know? So it's like the the story of progress is kind of the the machine that is that is tying everything together of us consuming natural wilderness and turning it into civilization that's basically the story that we're all going on and it's like this stampede that everyone's a part of it's like oh my god americans are so stressed why are we so stressed because we have to keep up with the 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 joneses what the fuck is the pace that we're going on for we're fucking floating through outer space like why are we all pushing ourselves so hard to be so stressed to reach the next goal to do whatever it's like what's the fucking point we're all gonna be on this planet for another million years like why are we so why are we stressing ourselves out to keep up with this crazy pace you know the theory is that we're building a better quality of life that's the whole point of civilization to build a better quality of life but my whole theory is that our civilization is not building a better quality of life. We have extreme flaws in so many things and we need to re redesign our civilization to prioritize wellness of the population, not these fucking arbitrary goals. Like I was listening to a podcast today and they're like, oh, they'll never do a study comparing, um, comparing uh, breath to whatever because there's no profit to be made. So like, if you boil that down, it's like, we literally will not prioritize human wellness, something that could help the whole universe because there's no profit. There's no invisible green paper. <laughs> it's like, we're fucking on this like stupid <laughs> hallucination of a civilization that has like just created our own problems by, by having a, a, an external thing of money that's more prioritized than our own well-being as as a society you know so that's a huge issue too we've 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 prioritized profit over actual human wellness and planet wellness well yeah so. that's a huge thing that links all the problems together i would say interesting um there's so many things i can add on this i'll add i'll add a couple I'll add yeah, a couple. yeah, why yeah. Not, why not? Gosh, okay yeah. so um there's this there's this argument there's this or and i want to because we're talking about the history of civilizations, and I think it's quite interesting. There's this argument um, that that um, currently, and I want to see what you make of it. Yeah. Currently, with our financial system, you'll never be able to get the completely renewable resources. Mm -hmm. And I can give you the reason why. So the argument is sort of like, let's just think of this. Like any time that we, me and you are, uh, any product or service we buy is made out of energy. So the shirt yeah. that you have, the yeah. stick you have, that yeah. hat right there, that phone right there, yeah. either energy had to be pulled out of the we had the either the trend uh the transportation of the thing cost energy yeah. the storing of the thing cost energy the mining of the materials all cost energy yeah right um and basically we have to increase gdp every year by like two to three percent yeah so that just basically means that we're just increasing how much even, energy even is though used. we're 40 trillion dollars, dollars in, in debt, debt. <laughs> We're just increasing how much energy is being used every single year. So yeah. that means you have to replace all the old infrastructure mm -hmm. with renewable resources yeah. and then all the new infrastructure yeah. with renewable resources. And it just seems pretty difficult to do that. Yeah. Um, 
to tie this back to the, all the civilizations, um, you can think of all the past 10,000 years of civilization as basically domestication of energy, either exactly. in the domestication of crops, yeah. right? Because that allowed you to get the first civilization mm -hmm. or, the, or taking oil out of the, the earth yeah. and then using that for transportation and everything like that. Yeah. I want to know what you think about that argument. Well, yeah, I think that we've we've been massively created using a shit ton of energy to build our civilization and it's it's unsustainable unless we figure out an actual sustainable fuel source and sorry to break it to everyone but solar panels is not actually sustainable be, in yeah. many ways because yeah. as you mentioned the cobalt mines like there's a book coming out about how like countries in the in in congo or in the country of congo, congo it's yeah. like you know, massive slave labor camps to create these things that build our solar panels and shit. It's like, clearly that's not sustainable. I think we all need to fucking humble ourselves and live more like the Amish for the most part. You, <laughs> you know, like we, we've had like this, it's like you give a kid, you give a kid um, Mountain Dew every night for dinner. The kid gets addicted and used to Mountain Dew. And then you try to give him water and they're like, this is boring. I don't like water. Mm -hmm. And that's basically our civilization. Like we've like gotten this giant dose of like, of coal and oil and stuff. And we have our mansions and we're used to this high carbon lifestyle, but it's not sustainable. And we, I think we all just need to realize like what actually makes us happy. The things that actually make us happy don't require Hummers and mansions and stuff. It, it's like community and massage trains that are happening right here, chilling in the woods. It's like if we all just really did an honest look at what makes us happy, it doesn't take that much. And so if we redesigned our whole civilization to prioritize happiness and wellness rather than just like stupid material shit that does absolutely nothing pretty much nothing for anyone and and like factored in the way that it affects the planet mm -hmm. like i think we could easily shift everything quickly if everyone got on the same page of like oh let's just prioritize human wellness and planet wellness you know uh let me add something real quick uh so um one thing i if you actually go to an old person's home right mm -hmm. and you listen to or when their people they're on their deathbed and you listen yeah. to them talk about the thing how their life was going yeah and then they start talking about like the things that they may have regret exactly. one thing that comes up for a lot of guys actually is that they regret not spending a lot of time with their children yeah or they regret like not starting some sort of company or something uh -huh. that they wish they would done yeah. a long time ago yeah um so it it really sh it really uh i uh, uh one thing that I would challenge a lot of people to think about is yeah. like what is actually meaningful. That's one thing. Exactly. I'll say. Yeah. Like, if if our society re reassessed everything more to that effect, a lot would change. It's like we have this whole sure. story of progress, progress. <clears throat> Where the fuck are we progressing to? I mean, we're eating, the, we're shooting ourselves in the foot in so many ways, and it's like. What if we what if we redesign things? There's a thing called donut economics, which donut economics, yeah. redesigns economics. That's definitely worth checking out. Very interesting. Um, yeah, we can go into that for a long period of time. Like that would be an hour conversation there. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. One other thing I wanted to share, which is that my general philosophy of life is that it's this massive hodgepodge pu jigsaw puzzle mosaic of energy, just like a zillion colors swirling that's what reality is and what we try to do is is make sense of that hodgepodge of energy and like we create stories and systems and 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 rules and things to understand it mm -hmm. and some of them we've done a pretty good job like physics we understand physics to the degree that we can build a fucking bridge and it works for the most part it doesn't just fall down so like clearly we understand some of how reality works but there's other aspects of reality that we haven't fully understood. And a lot of times we create models of how reality, we think it works and then we get obsessed with our models and we're like, have them like strapped to our eyes. And this is what I think, in, this is my critique of integral theory. It's like the people who are into spiral dynamics are like walking around with spiral dynamic yeah, glasses on all the time. Yeah. And they can't, they fit everything into That's that right. frame 
The same could be said sometimes for astrology. The same could be said for, you know, if you're really obsessed with capitalism, with capitalism whatever. Yeah, you only Anything. you only see making profit everywhere you go. So I call them the perceptual spectacles, which could also be called a reality tunnel, which is like the the reality tunnel that you've chosen. And it's kind of like the filter that you see everything through. But um, one of my homies who's a great philosopher, you got to check out Eric Godsey. I mean, he's not my homie yet, but we're definitely going to be homies. <laughs> I've watched like every one of his videos. He's a fucking beast. And he talks about, he says, I like to hang out with people that are on their third reality tunnel, at least their third reality tunnel. Because mm. basically you, you grow up with a certain reality tunnel. A lot of people have some kind of awakening. They're like, oh, I want to be vegan. So then they switch to the vegan reality tunnel. And then maybe they realize, and maybe they get really attached to that reality tunnel. I mean, this could be anything. It could switch religions. It could switch political parties, whatever. But when you really shift from that second reality tunnel to your third one, you'd be like, oh, there's actually many different ways to see the world. And everyone's walking around their different ways. Mm -hmm. You kind of like respect that everyone's just in their own reality tunnel and that and this is based on a dude, Robert Anton Wilson, who's another phenomenal philosopher. You gotta, you gotta give you I've been chance. obsessed with philosophy for like 15 years, so I got a lot, <laughs> a lot of recommendations. But Robert Anton Wilson is all about being flexible in your reality tunnel and being able to look through different ones. Because yeah. most, people are just so most people are just so obsessed with their own reality tunnel. They like poop their pants the minute you like try to say something that doesn't fit their reality tunnel um and a lot of that boils down to like working with your nervous system not being like fight or flight all the time so um so that goes back to what you were saying earlier like the ego development models yeah i want to talk about that too because the ego development models are basically different reality tunnels to look through can you list off the ones you did earlier? Yeah, so, uh, so. While you're talking, I'm gonna see if you're on camera. Stay yeah, with me. Yeah, yeah. Oh. See, so you're, you're, you're sneaking off. You're, you're still on camera, okay, but good, you're good. good, good. Yeah, so, okay. What's right. up? There you go, all right. Um, so how do I explain ego development? So, so ego developmental models are like, um, how do you explain it? These are like um, models, uh, these are like models of, I don't know developments of ego basically that would that, make they, total sense they, you know, but um each level that somebody goes up they can understand a higher level of complexity that's mm -hmm. a good way of thinking about okay. it so for example let's just say that you are someone at a low level of ego development um they would if somebody low level of ego development might have a very hard under hard time understanding things like mathematics for that matter mm -hmm. or uh or um, any type of stat statistics or quantum yeah. uh, uh quantitative data etc yeah. um the higher you go you start getting into like um you'll get to somebody who's maybe like at a um a uh achiever level of development so these are m most people in our society are like this where they yeah. the number one thing they want to do is become uh, uh successful i have to get i have to go work at a specific company and i have to go do this i have to start a company i have to go to harvard i have to go um, become a billionaire in order to get the the type of reputation. It's the achiever mindset. Yeah. Then you have somebody who is sort of like um, a pluralistic mindset where they're they're more they're not achiever, but they're more of like um, um, everything is relative, right? So you have your truth and I have my truth, yeah. and it doesn't really matter. And uh -huh. you know everything is relative to the person. And then you have another another um, another level of where they start being able to look at. Um, um, uh let's think of uh i'm trying to think um they'll start they'll start thinking of things in context yeah right so they'll yeah. um you hear you hear a lot well i'm gonna stop there i'm gonna i'm gonna let you i'm gonna let okay you just, well yeah just, uh, so that that's related to spiral dynamics right in some it's, in it's, some way in some ways in some ways okay so so yeah i think that there's a lot of truth in that and it's like developmental psychology is like a really fun thing to study because just like looking as a kid's brain develops like the different phases that they go through developing the ego developing a sense of self you know it's like it's fascinating to look at the development of a human psychology 
but even as an adult there's also like other uh, levels, levels to yeah. it and i think a lot of it has to do with what i was talking about like the reality tunnels like realizing that you can step back from yourself and observe yourself that's a shift because most people are just locked into who they are and they haven't necessarily taken that observer view as much mm -hmm. to realize that there's a part of yourself that is is the the witness that's not necessarily the full you which i think is a trap that some people get stuck in thinking like the true self is just the observer and this is just a boring human shell i'm like no i think we're actually mind body and spirit like all one big pie one big thing and you can like tap into the spirit part or you can tap into the body part or the mind part mm -hmm. but long story short to what you were saying um the theory that there's these different levels it can have truth to it but i think it can also be potential potentially problematic when you see it as a hierarchy and this is my part of my issue with ken wilbur it's like oh us here in the integral realm we've figured it all out and we just look down at those at those poor little peasants who haven't like figured it out and and especially when it comes to indigenous cultures they're like perhaps saying like oh these indigenous people or, are still at a are, super low level of exactly development. they're yeah. still superstitious or they're they're having these magical beliefs when a lot of the times the stuff that they can do far super far um surpasses some of some of our healing abilities and stuff so like that's one of my main issues is like having a hierarchy of saying like these people are the best and these people are <laughs> the, worst, the yeah. worst and i'm not saying he does that super hardcore but there's people but in the integral can, community it can kind of infer that, that like oh wow these people are still you know believing in spirits and things like that and again it's like people getting stuck in believing that their reality tunnel is the perfect one which is the big message of ishmael the book that started it all for me mm -hmm. his core message is there's no one right way mm -hmm. to live that's the key interesting no one ever did that to me uh, <laughs> there you go. chris is a master massager oh uh, yeah here. let's actually open it up to our audience oh uh, right? yeah yeah what do you guys anybody want to come on camera and and sh speak some speak some words yeah you I, like, got, I got a question you got okay. some okay you want to ask me or Jerome, or you just want to jump in in between? I'll throw it to both of you, man. Why, why don't we do a one, two, three, we first? This, it's very important that you play while you're philosophizing. Okay, one, two, three, we. <laughs> well done. Well done. All right, it's still forming, so it's gonna come out. Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. a little wonky. We, we, we're Sorry. doing it semi-spontaneous out here. That's the way. But my big thing is, how do we boil down philosophy to a practical level? Sure. So my question is, for the average person, like, what is the incentive to shift or alter their lifestyle? Because, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen impoverished people, mm -hmm. and in the third world, a lot of the desire to go to the first world is for security. Uh -huh. You know, we have food security here. We, we have a lot of wealth, yeah. monetary wealth, which, you know, can affect... We have problems sure. with mental health, but... For the most part we're safe yeah mm -hmm. so how for the average person like on a global perspective yeah. do you incentivize a shift in lifestyle that yeah. may be risky sure for some people mm -hmm. um with yeah. this philosophy in mind yeah well i think it comes down to the classical maslow's hierarchy of needs in a lot of way like clearly we need to have a, a society where everyone has their basic needs covered that should be a, a given and if we all would get off our fucking capitalist ego bullshit one fucking billionaire could have that done tomorrow like straight up <laughs> like these people are spending trillions of dollars to go to outer space to like do some test on fucking mars that could feed and clothe everyone on planet Earth tomorrow. So, like, to me, that's that's easy. Once enough trillionaires fucking awaken their consciousness and open their hearts. But to me, we need to, like, just create a, a, a culture of understanding what is a true quality of life. Because I don't believe that kids in America are actually happier than most kids in, say, 
Botswana. Like a lot of they they probably have different problems, but if we created more of an understanding of like what is a good quality of life and how to achieve that in a sustainable way and like broadcast that to the world that so it's would, like an education it's, a it's an education edu challenge it's an education challenge and also redesigning our economy to not have its primary goal as profit and have its primary goal as the well-being of the people and the society because mm -hmm. that to me is like the whole <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, I, I hear. Yeah, can I add some things? Yeah. Okay, so one. So, I think a, uh, I think one thing it comes down to is like looking at what is actually important and what is actually valuable. So I'll give you an example, right? Like, and I was, and I mentioned this to somebody not too long ago. It's like, you know, um, a lot of billionaires actually get upset when they see somebody with a bigger yacht than them. But you can also have, like, you can go to Thailand where there's Buddhist monks who sitting there in a forest meditating all day, feeling fulfilled by exactly. just being there. Exactly. Right. So like, I think, I think this, I think a lot of the, I think one part of this, not all of it, but one thing that comes down to is the just, world needs to do more mushrooms, you know? Yeah. Maybe, 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 <laughs> maybe and perhaps maybe that's it. Um, that's, that's one thing I would say. Um, it, and like, like Kevin said, it's not clear that, um, kids in America is much more happier than kids in like other countries. Um, they're so. probably by many metrics far uh, far unhealthier i mean the obesity rates the diabetes type 2 diabetes rates the adhd rates like all of this stuff is just astronomical when they have supposedly all the material things they could ever want you know mm -hmm. so yeah i think that that and and in order to show people the alternative we need to create experiences and places like festivals and conferences where people can have a glimpse of what it's like like oh my god i just had the best three days of my life and i didn't go on my phone once or i didn't i didn't um drive a mercedes i once how did that happen oh my god you're telling me that the greatest three days of my life was just hanging out with people in the woods making our own food around a fire like that those are the kind of experiences that shift people to realize like like i think i think my truth is like if everyone was really honest with themselves and had these experiences as, as like a buffet of like hey try this for a month try this for a month try this for a month if everyone was mm. just super duper honest with themselves i think that they would choose a more natural life okay i got some for you because yeah. I, I think what you're describing here is the how how we do it sure. and tie in the conversation from the beginning when we yeah. started to create fire we started to say i created fire yes. this is me mm -hmm. and then agriculture we started to say this is my land yeah. so that ego started to develop as a survival mechanism yeah. and this how you're describing is to me sounds like how do we help people set down their strong ego which is mm -hmm. leading them to do more and create more technology yeah. and yeah and then i think the question that i'm trying to get at is why would they set down mm -hmm. their yeah. ego yeah. because it's secure yeah so what what would lead them to mm -hmm. like yeah well yeah. to go back to charles eisenstein he has a great essay called the invisible path which i highly recommend to everyone where he talks about like these seven different phases of what he calls the invisible path and one is that one of the big phases is the glimpse experience where you glimpse another way of being or another way of seeing the world and so i think that to answer your question why would say a billionaire sell his company and do something else i think they would do it if they had a true glimpse experience you know so then the question is like how to get people to have a glimpse experience i guess let me add something um it's also not one variable that um to get so your specific question it's not one one thing that can like solve all of these things it'll be a question of okay people in like poor countries you will have to get them wealthy enough in order so they can stop worrying about their exactly. own individual things and they can think about more of the world 
get a more of a world centric perspective yeah, yeah, yeah. right so like if i'm for example if i'm thinking so much about like how am i actually going to get enough water for the next week i'm not really thinking about global issues i'm not thinking about if the if the all the trees in the amazon rainforest is going to go is going to go down i'm not i'm just all this stuff i'm not thinking about exactly i'm not thinking about your needs exactly so if you got enough people rich enough they'll start to think about other things and it's not that much it's maybe sixty thousand dollars per per on per, per person something around those lines maybe it's less maybe it's more something around those lines um or my fault three thousand gdp per capita something like that can't, yeah, can't yeah, yeah. That. um whatever it is they need to have to not be so obsessed with paying the next month's bills that they can't think about these other things and then you need but, something from a cultural perspective and this might be where charles eisen's thing comes in at yeah is where you look at you educate the people enough to actually think of nature as something as sacred right so mm -hmm. it's not something that should be used as the functional utility of the tree it should be looked at as something sacred that we should always keep there so it has to come from a culture perspective as well yeah. and it has to come from an individual perspective as well, well so I'll, I'll give that but and yeah. you can't have and also one more thing you can't have a whole system that um that uh that thrives off of uh people not thinking about this stuff right because if you have an education system that teaches people yeah. that this stuff is not really that important we should look at the functional utility of trees and uh -huh. all this other stuff yeah. you're not going to get uh, people thinking in the terms of like the yeah. philosophers and actually thinking of sacredness and all that stuff. yeah education is huge and that's i think we need a whole a whole redesign of of schools in america and, and most places i mean the, the Waldorf schooling and the Montessori schooling is like a good sort of blueprint. But it's like we were barely taught anything about emotional intelligence, about how to take good care of our bodies in a holistic way. Like all these important, really baseline things. I think if we had a whole education system that helped kids get more in tune with themselves, then they would naturally want to protect nature they would naturally want to yeah. do these other Woo! things but if they're like if they're like shot up with all kinds of chemicals every day and like living in artificial light it's like you're taking them out of harmony with their natural homeostasis and then they're just going to continue to propagate that like chaos within themselves you know and so yeah, I don't have all the answers, but there's a lot of good resources out there that I think that's what I try to compile on my all my YouTube playlists are like education resources, permaculture resources, you know, learning about plant medicines, learning about indigenous wisdom. I have like a playlist on pretty much every topic I could think of <laughs> because I, I do really believe education is a huge piece because you're not going to change something if you don't even know what the alternative is can i add something to what you yeah. just said so uh you can sort of like you can think of you can have two end of the spectrum right so one end you can have child soldiers in, in africa right mm -hmm. walking around with ak-47s yeah. or you can either have the complete opposite of that is like people who are jains where they're so um they they care so much about nature where they won't even hurt bugs yeah. right so you can have child soldier on one end people who are don't even want to hear hurt bugs on the other end so humans are really maladaptable and if we actually can get the right education system it actually can help but it, it's much more than the education system you have to get the wealth thing right you have to get the education system right yeah. you have to get um the values of the people right as well right because totally, if yeah. if the values are not right we can exactly. have we can have all we can change all of these things but yeah. if um if the um if the relationship between the person and the thing and the trees yeah, for that exactly. matter is not changed yeah. then they'll mm. continue to like chop them all down for that so, matter i think you're getting to something there yeah because i think when i am trying to understand why would people change for me i can see a common common the common needs across all humans are for connection yeah. and you know if you're a billionaire and you're kind of like just producing more and more buildings and technology and ideas i think that can actually come from a place of insecurity that that person 
isn't actually receiving connection so they're creating more and more to try to fill that void yeah yeah so i think that's that's speaking to me as far as like what could be a driving force to encourage people to to change because whether you're a billionaire or you're uh living in poverty you know that that is we have the same needs mm -hmm. for absolutely for connection and, and the other you know basic needs of food and shelter and yeah but yeah that that um and I think of technology, like this ability to share this. We are having a conversation that's meaningful, and then we can be recognized yeah. for it and connect across yeah. the whole world. Yeah. You know, so that that really honing in on connection. And then who is this for? Like, who are we trying to connect? Is this for people like us? Mm -hmm. Is this for a billionaire? Mm -hmm. Is this for uh, someone in a developing country where we're like no don't, don't don't get on these phones like don't like like you know yeah. it can be secure but but don't use it to the point where it's then becomes a vice mm -hmm. you know so i think that that can be helpful to understand those which demographics are we speaking yeah. to and and what do they need yeah no, I think those are great questions. And yeah, Jerome, I think you made a great point about like, it's really important for us to hone in on what are our core values. Um, and I think you make a great point of like knowing who, who we're trying to t talk to. We're talking to you, whoever's still watching this. <laughs> yeah. um, 20 years from now. 20 years watching. from now. I mean, I got videos from... <laughs> 12, 13 years ago, still I on YouTube. He just watched one of them. <laughs> there you go. So you guys might be tuning in this in freaking 2160. Who knows? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think we should wrap it up here. Do, do y'all want to share any closing closing uh, remarks or pieces of wisdom, questions, ideas with our friends of the multiverse? <laughs> um, uh I hope for a better future. <laughs> that's, my, that's my closing. That's, that's my closing. Closing thought. That's what's up. How about you? Um, I think what comes to mind is, yeah, minimalism and just coming back to the basics. And the more that we can realize what we already need is right in front of us and the people around us. I think yeah. the less we need. The security that technology and and wealth provide for us so yeah we're doing it right here and i think leading by example is yeah one of the most powerful ways to to make change so absolutely yeah. and my final spiel is that if you're still here if you've listened to this whole conversation you're awesome and uh thanks for giving us energy from the future to fuel our energy and have a little tennis match back and forth and um my spiel for the end is that i believe 98 percent of the stuff on the internet is kind of like garbage and it's not worth your time or your energy or your attention but there's about two percent that is super freaking amazing and awesome and totally worth your time and attention and to encourage you to seek out that two percent whether it's music podcasts videos that actually make you laugh that are good quality you know things like that just really focusing on that two percent of stuff that actually nourishes you and not like kim kardashian's next butt and plant so that's my encouragement to find that two percent hopefully this qualifies as part of that two percent that's actually pushing humanity forward in a good direction so let's get a group hug in here you guys want to get in this <laughs> Group hug for our audience, too. We got some good people. Get on in on this camera, people. We got, this is our friends from the future are going to join in this, too. Cedar's waving. We got Cedar, Cedar the seed eater here. He, he ate some grapes with seeds, and he loved them. That was, that was beautiful. Yeah. Uh -huh. And Swan. The yeah. Mesopotamian bird. Yeah. The lightning bear. And Elliot the... the Man of nature. <laughs> Happy Tuesday. Like Friends of the future. It's a, it's a photo on video. Oh my gosh. We can take a screenshot of it. All right, y'all. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday.
Happy Tuesday. <laughs> it's still cruising.